Hello everybody, I'm Mark America from the Art and Art History Department and I too would like to thank Thea and Alex and the libraries for holding, holding this event and it's great to, uh, to be here with my colleagues and with the visitors from out of town. Uh, as I said to John Unsworth when I ran into him after their opening session, uh, postmodern culture, for those of you who are aware of it, 1990 was uh, available on the web. It's very influential in the development of my own online publishing network that I launched in 1993, uh, the Altex Online Publishing Network, which is at altx.com, and that I'll uh, touch on in a minute. So the title of my uh, presentation, let's call it, is uh, Practice-Based Research in the Digital Arts and Humanities. So the first question, of course, just for those who are unaware, is what is uh, practice-based <laughs> research? Which is a good question. Uh, and for a straightforward definition, I always turn to uh, Li <coughs> Linda Candy, who in collaboration with Ed, uh, Ernest Edmonds, leads the Creativity and Cognition Studios at the University of Technology, Sydney, where I was an artist in residence back in 2005, finishing uh, my book for MIT Press, Metadata Digital Poetics. So in answer to the question, what is practice-based research, Candy uh, writes, practice-based research, PBR, is an original investigation undertaken in order to gain new knowledge partly by means of practice and the outcomes of that practice. So we're now going to start slipping into what are other potential outcomes, say, besides the, uh, yeah, the scholarly monograph, for example. We've, we've been talking about that a little bit. So uh, in answer to that question, uh, Candy uh, writes, in a doctoral thesis, claims of originality and contribution to knowledge may be demonstrated through creative outcomes in the form of uh, designs, music, digital media, performance, and exhibitions. So all of these outcomes she refers to seem appropriate to me as well, although, and the list can go on, but I'll add a few others just so that we can start expanding uh, our concepts of what these outcomes can be. Software art, mobile media and web art apps for smartphones and tablets, interactive and electronic forms of creative writing and publication, and transmedia narrative or multi-platform storytelling, and finally, uh, a subject that's come up already a bit today, digital curation. Although when I drop the term digital curation, I assume that, yes, it's a term that could point to a field in flux, one that, uh, for example, refers to uh, a field of specialization in library and information science focused on preparing professionals for the curation of digital collections but that I too uh, can morph for my own uses and stretch to include experimental forms of digital art as curation, vis-a-vis -vis what uh, in a book uh, called Creative Evolution, Natural Selection and the Urge to Remix, I call an embodied remixological praxis. And that book that I'm referring to, Creative Evolution, uh, was published in the UK as part of the Living Books About Life series, which was funded uh, through a research grant with uh, the JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee. So the editors of that series referred to this Living Books About Life series as, quote, a series of curated open access books about life with life understood both philosophically and biologically, which provide a bridge between the humanities and the sciences. <coughs> so basically these liquid books, uh, as the editors refer to them, are produced as experimental digital titles published under the conditions of both open editing and free content, where readers become read writers, let's say, who are free to annotate, edit, tag, remix, or reuse any of the books in the series in any way they want to, and in fact are encouraged to do so. So I mentioned some of, some of these various practice-based research outcomes, including that, that uh, kind of open book, uh, because in the uh, TECNE practice-based research initiative that I started when I first arrived at CU almost 15 years ago, we've been attempting to expand the concepts of writing, art, publishing, performance, and even exhibition and curation so that they simultaneously relate to but also move in different directions away from what traditionally we might refer to as the fine arts and the literary arts. So I'm just going to bring it back to that 
little statement by Candy where she casually drops the phrase in a doctoral thesis as it relates to practice-based arts research. Uh, this is, to say the least, a part of a dialogue still in development here in the US, uh, not as much so in Canada, the UK, and Australia. And one that's still meeting some resistance from those who identify their studio-based practices within a traditional MFA program environment. One that oftentimes pays lip service to the concept of interdisciplinary and collaborative creative research, but that feels tradition bound to rigid disciplinary distinctions within the curriculum, even though most of the students are already well beyond that. But having said that, there is a national movement now affiliated with uh, this organization, the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, an initiative that comes to us out of the University of Michigan and also funded by the Mellon Foundation, that's triggering a discussion here on our campus as well as other major research universities across the country that focuses on ways to expand the role that the arts and creativity in general play across the campus uh, so that practice-based research methodologies can actually intervene in, complement, and or at times challenge traditional research practices from other disciplines. Now, as with most American universities, CU has been a bit behind the curve on all of this, but there have been, there is a sort of a history here, let's say, of local attempts to at least begin investigating the, the potential synergistic uh, relationships between, uh, in our case, digital art, writing, performance, and curation, as well as the social media culture that pervades so much of our daily lives. And it almost goes without saying that today's event that B and Alex are putting on uh, is really a great opportunity for us to assess where we're at right now. And thanks again for putting this on. So I'm gonna, going to just lay out uh, an ultra fast and very subjective history of practice-based research here at CU as it relates to the digital arts and humanities. And I'll start in the year 2000 for two obvious reasons. One is that it's a nice round number that we can refer to when we look back and try to see where practice-based research started popping its head up. And two, because it just co coincidentally happened to be the year that I was hired as an assistant professor here at CU. <laughs> So to my surprise, in the year 2000, just as I arrived at CU, I found out about a new innovation lab that was being funded by Omnicom, right? That's uh, the world's top corporate media services conglomerate. And uh, I won't get into the details of how that all came to be, but what was more important to me at the time was that uh, professors Michael Leitner from engineering and David Slayton from the former School of Journalism and Mass Communication uh, who were directing this Omnicom funded initiative under the guise of what soon came to be known as the Blur Lab, they sent out a call for proposals that my colleague in fine arts, the now retired former chair, Jim Johnson and I, applied for in hopes of starting what was then uh, something really quite radical, a new ebook and print on demand bo uh, book series as part of the Altex uh, online publishing network which, you, like I said, you can see at altx.com. Uh, I started this in 1993, uh, years before getting into academia, and all the, uh, all the work that was produced by that international network is still archived uh, at the site. So at this time in 2000, when I started here at CU, Altex had been written up in many mainstream academic and underground or alternative media outlets as the place where the digerati meet the literati. In fact, if you look closely there, that's our, uh, was our logo, or our uh, slogan. And, uh, and Jim and I were fortunate in that we were subsequently awarded a useful seed grant from the Omnicom initiative, whereupon we immediately began experimenting with the design and editorial development of an ebook and print-on-demand book series that complemented what we saw as the avant pop aesthetic agenda of the site. And if you go to Alt-X, there's loads of information on uh, what we mean by avant pop aesthetic agenda. Now these eBooks were designed for both computer reading as well as for portable, or what we would now call mobile reading devices. So imagine that, it's 2000, 2001, and we're already thinking about net connected mobile reading devices that fit in the palm of your hand. In fact, our marketing line at that time was fiction for palm pilots. 
<laughs> Does anybody here know what a palm pilot is? <laughs> that, was, that, that was all you had, but it was, it was enough for us to get excited about it. So, okay, so at the turn of the century then, Altex is developing its parallel POD, right, print-on-demand strategy in consultation with a startup company called Book Surge. And so we were able to get in on the early stages of an emergent publishing practice that we were researching both for, for our own creative and ed editorial predilections, but also, more importantly, as a way to investigate what at the time we imagined were soon going to become the near future forms of book publishing and artist books, something that we imagined would affect scholarly publishing as well. Of course, both ebooks and POD would quickly become part of a standard business model for many publishers looking to optimize their production and inventory costs, although for our research, it was more about how the new forms of publishing could engender more provocative conceptual models for art and literature in the field of distribution. And here I'll just note for the heck of it a quote from uh, conceptual artist Marcel Bruthers, who once wrote that, quote, the definition of artistic activity occurs, first of all, in the field of distribution, which today would match up nicely, say, with some of the contemporary media studies focused on what is sometimes referred to as the circulatory term. And also for those who are interested or care about such things, this uh, book surge, this small startup out of North Carolina that our lab here in, in 2000-2001 uh, first started working with uh, was eventually bought out by Amazon and has since been transformed into Amazon's ebook and POD platform that they call CreateSpace, which is where we uh, still house our books, but now with just like endless others. So at the same time that we were developing an ebook and POD series, <coughs> Uh, I was just getting started developing a new art curriculum focused on digital art as part of the uh, studio arts program in the fine arts department. So it's, it should be noted that the fine arts, of course, play a key role in everything we talk about when we talk about practice-based research in the digital arts and humanities. Uh, the depth and breadth of knowledge that is created and shared in fine arts departments like the one I'm rostered in here cannot be emphasized enough. So my remit upon arrival was to expand the department's research and teaching portfolio. And so instead of just turning the so-called digital area, uh, which, which at the time was referred to quaintly as the Mac Lab, uh, into something inefficient or in inessential, I decided to employ a different tact and created the Techne Practice-Based Research Initiative in the Digital Arts one that I believe was the first or certainly one of the first practice-based research initiatives in the arts and humanities here at CU. Since we're here, uh, meaning on campus, I'm thinking, well, I don't want to lose track of the keynote. So you can go to, while you're on campus, you can go to art.colorado.edu. But if you're off campus, you won't be able to access it. And so that's my one wish, wish list, I guess, since we're being asked for that, is that, uh, the art.colorado.edu site uh, was built in the, like, yeah, like I say, 2000 to 2000, 2001 to 2005, and uh, it hasn't been able to grow that much since because there's a uh, there's some security holes in the database, and so we need to sort of firm up that and possibly find a way to put it into a new content management system, as well as archive the site as it as it looks right now, so that we we have uh, the historical documentation of its current interface design. And uh, unfortunately, the support to make that happen, although I've been looking for it for many years now, hasn't really ever come into place. And I do think, given its historical context, it's something of a legacy site, something that we might certainly want to consider. And, uh, and I get emails constantly from folks who, who teach or used to teach it uh, as part of their syllab syllabus or syllabi and uh, wondering when it's going to go back online. Okay, so in addition to launching the, the art.colorado.edu site, I also made an executive decision and branded the space where the students pursued their digital art making the Experimental Digital Art Studio. This was changing the Mac Lab to the Experimental Digital Art Studio. So this interdisciplinary collaboratory was no longer a space exclusively viewed by self-identified art students to write their art history papers in although when it wasn't in use, it was good for that, but was much more focused on challenging the, uh, what I would call the individual studio artist as genius model in hopes of opening up 
or unleashing the creative potential of students to collaboratively build and invent new forms of art that were in the process of becoming part of the contemporary art landscape, and particularly uh, art on the internet. This is something that the students who uh, pass through EDAS continue to experiment with today. Now, as someone who, uh, as part of their practice, is also very big on not only documenting current creative project development, but also theorizing and speculating on future forms of artistic practice and their relationship to the university's growing interest in creative research and pedagogy, my goal was, is, and always uh, will be uh, to advocate for a more advanced practice-based arts research agenda as an essential part of the university. So the main reason I advocate for this kind of thing is because I think it's actually becoming clear or clearer to all the stakeholders that practice-based artistic research methods involve creative work process, processes that could provide uh, useful insights for the larger research culture across the campus. You know, so simple questions like, what is it that makes an artist tick? How do these creative collaborators working on, say, an art project for an exhibition in a public space think differently than their colleagues in the sciences? And why do so many of the practice-based research methodologies benefit from relying more on, say, intuition or the performance of the body, tapping into one's unconscious creative potential, and or testing multiple conceptual frameworks for the work to organically evolve in, and, and as artists know all too well, take on a life of their own. So I'm just going to close by very briefly mentioning uh, just one more example of a project clustering around these ideas that I've been floating here. Uh, Practice-based research, remixology, digital art as curation, digital arts humanities collaboration, uh, transmedia forms of scholarly creative work outcomes. Uh, the project that I am referring to is Remix the Book or remixthebook.com. So I developed Remix the Book in 2010-2011 uh, with the support of my publisher, the University of Minnesota Press, as well as an internal Caden research grant from the College of Arts and Sciences, and perhaps most importantly, the support of the Center for Humanities and Art here at CU as part of the Center's Data Research Initiative that Lori and I launched uh, a couple of years ago. So Data, D-A-T-A, -A, if you'll excuse the uh, acronymphomania, which is a <laughs> word that I think James Joyce might be proud of. Uh, <laughs> DATA stands for Digital Arts and Textuality Alliance. And Laurie and I imagine it to be a collaborative digital arts and humanities <laughs> research group focused on investigating new forms of digital writing, art, uh, theory, exhibition, performance, <coughs> publishing, curation, as well, of course, as a space to develop uh, these cross-disciplinary research uh, subjects regarding media archaeology that Lori's already introduced you to. So one of the areas of research and development that I've been looking at as part of data is how print books, innovative websites, mobile applications, and social media performance as curation can all work together to create a kind of transmedia publication that at times looks like an exhibition as well as a site of documented performance, and how this might co-evolve in conjunction with a university press publication. Uh, so Remix the Book was our first transmedia publishing collaboration with the University of Minnesota Press, who, it should be noticed since she didn't mention it, will be publishing Lori's uh, new book next spring. So it's with, uh, it was with great excitement that the Remix the Book team launched what today I refer to as our Transmedia Book, capital T, capital B, in homage to Mallarmé, the late 19th century symbolist poet, whose idea that every, I'm quoting, and everything in the world exists to end up in a book, partly informs my thinking here, although is quite different than the Remix tweet I posted last week that said, everything in the world does not exist to end up in a tweet. <laughs> uh, so a quick survey of the site will introduce you to some of the uh, over 25 curated video, audio, textual, visual, animation, scholarly remixes of the source material I sent to the very art various artists, or the team did, we had a team of curators. Uh, 
around the world to remix at will and thus contribute to the initial layer of experiments that the project was meant to trigger. We also created a, a new position, social media curator, that was filled by our top-ranked art history honors student, whose honors thesis was primarily focused on internet art, uh, social media networking, and political hacktivism, and who worked, was able to work with over 15 additional colleagues around uh, the world, but also locally, such as uh, Joel and Lori, uh, who would fill in as our guest TJ, was the phrase we came up with, Twitter jockey, at the remix, uh, the book, Twitter account. So that's at remix, the book. And for those who care, I'm at Mark America. Uh, so there's a section devoted uh, here to the uh, Remix Culture course that I teach that se seeded the concept for the Remix the Book project, focusing on themes such, and you can see them all there, collage art, appropriation, uh, plagiarism with a Y, detournement, uh, DJ VJ live audio performance, literary cut-ups, and the like. Uh, in the About section, I, I end my introductory remarks uh, by saying, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll just use these uh, remarks to end my presentation, uh, my hope is that other interdisciplinary artists, adventurous writers, expert amateurs in the network and mobile media arts, digital humanities scholars, and innovative arts educators will be able to use this hybridized publication and performance project to experiment with their own practice-based research into remix art and culture this is why I put the source material out there in the first place. So by all means, remix the book. <laughs> Thank you.